So welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Uh, the Legendinos over there in Rio looking resplendent, I must say. And it's winter over there, isn't it? Winter in South America, yeah. uh, which means Sounds around... Like song. Yeah, yeah, which means around 25 By Gil Scott Heron. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> That's the one. Of course it <laughs> yes. is. Mate, you know, we've we've covered what I thought was every sort of corner of uh, world football in these Brazilian shirt name podcasts over the course of the last you know three years or so. But we've never been to one of the vastest landscapes of football, which is uh, South Asia. Why not? Well, I think we've, we've hardly been to the continent of the 21st century, have we? So uh, it's about it's about time that we put that right. And it's about time that we posed questions about why we haven't had more cause to talk about football in India. And I'm looking forward immensely over the next few minutes to be to being enlightened on this very subject. Yeah, this is a magical podcast, by the way, because we are joined, thankfully, by Somnath Sengupta, who is an Indian football historian. And you can take us back to the date of India's finest moment in football. Uh, sadly, we have to go right back to 1951 for that moment. Uh, and March of 1951, is it the Asian Games final? Right, yeah. Right, right, yeah. So it's India versus Iran. Yes, that's right. Yeah, How so did... thanks for having me on first. Absolute pleasure. pleasure. How did India do so well in these champions? In fact, you might want to give us the background to the Asian uh, championships. Yeah. So uh, basically, if we go back to the 1950s, right? I mean, uh, Novi Kapadia, who was an actual historian uh, of Indian football, he passed away a couple of years ago. He mentioned something very uh, nice about Indian football in that era. He mentioned that Indian football was basically a product of the amateur era. So as long as football was amateur, as long as Asian football was amateur, India did very well. So uh, if we go back to 1951 so at that point India had got her independence in 1947 only so after that the uh, the first major tournament was 1948 Olympics where India traveled to London uh, they played just one match uh, it was against France this was the French Olympic team so not the full strength uh, France team so they drew uh, they, they lost 2-1 uh, but they also missed two penalty kicks in, in that match so uh, but after uh, losing to France in the 1948 Olympics. They, on their way back, they also played several matches in different locations in Europe. These, these were exhibition matches. And one of these matches were against Ajax. I mean, even Ajax was amateur at that time. And India actually won 5-1 that match. And uh, then uh, there were talks of hosting the Asian Games. I mean, Asian Games, uh, there was nothing called Asian Games before the 1951 edition. This was the inaugural edition. So uh, the initial plan was to host it in 1950. But then the preparations that that took more time. So then finally, uh, the Asian Games were hosted in New at New Delhi uh, in 1951, early 1951. So uh, there were around 11 countries, I guess, that participated in the first uh, Asian Games. Uh, not every country was so. Basically, they uh, considered only the independent countries which had their own Olympic associations. So, uh, so only 11 countries participated and six of them actually sent their teams, uh, football teams. So, uh, <clears throat> India defeated Iran in the final 1-0. Uh, the matches were 60 minutes for the first edition of Asian Games. And the ground was particularly narrow, I guess, because the same stadium was used for uh, multi-purpose. Uh, it was a multi-purpose stadium, basically. You had athletic events going on in the same stadium also. So there were three matches altogether India played, and then uh, in the final, uh, India defeated Iran 1 0. Well, and we've only just touched on the history. This is a, a nice yeah, start. I mean, th 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 this is where I really want to get to because please excuse my extraordinary ignorance around this subject. So I, I come with, with questions, not answers. Right, right. And my, my first kind of thought I've never been to India, much to my regret, is that. I wonder if the Western perspective, both right and left, has under underestimated Indian history. Yeah. In, in, in terms of, of putting maybe too much emphasis on the colonial period, mm -hmm. which in the, in the huge scope of Indian history, the Raj, it's, it's a relatively short 
period of time. And it clearly leaves a legacy to be argued about. I would argue more bad than good because because domination by one of one over another is, is never positive in my view. <laughs> but part of the legacy that it's left is team sports such as football and and and, and cricket. Uh, so I wonder if if there's been from a Western view we've overestimated. It, it's that thing of you know my country wasn't discovered until the white man came. Right. Which is which is a highly patronising view, which denies agency, both good and bad, to the Indians. Mm-hmm. Now I've read that cricket was easier for the Indians to take up. It was e- it, it, it it was just it just responded better to the Indian soul. Because notions of cricket fit were easier to fit in to notions of the caste system of thousands and thousands of years in India. And that's one of the reasons why India became so big at cricket rather than football. How much do you give credence to, to, to that view? Uh, actually, uh, what I'll say is that cricket became more popular in India from 1980 onwards. Because uh, before 1980, at least, uh, football and hockey in terms of steam sports, these two were more uh, popular, at least in domestic oh. circuit. Because uh, cricket, even in 1970s or 60s, it was viewed more as a rich man's game, something that you played only on winters. But football, yeah, it had the mass appeal, obviously. And then it was it had a longer season also. I mean, you could play football during monsoons. Cricket, obviously, at that point, given the infrastructure that we had, cricket was mainly played in winters. Summers were too hot and uh, you couldn't uh, find the turfs on uh, monsoon. Hockey was obviously popular. and But football, domestically, in terms of club football and also how India got... The national team was actually pretty successful till 1970. So India won uh, 1951 Asian Games gold. 1962 Asian Games gold. 1962 is actually a more famous and a bigger triumph in Indian football history because India actually beat North South Korea in the final. Uh, again, a 2-1 result. Uh, then 1970, India won bronze in Asian Games. That was like the last major victory in the 20th century. So till 1970s, football was very popular. The national team had some level of success. But what happened from 1970s onward was the club football became more popular, actually. And uh, the national team's importance gradually declined. And the early 1980s, in my view, was the actual point where cricket became more popular than football. So if I take the first three years of 1980, the firstly, uh, there was a lot of violence in the football stadium. I mean, you had... uh, uh, People getting injured, frequent fights in the stadium. I mean, the policing was very minimal. So uh, on 16th August 1980, there was a match in Eden Gardens. I mean, the same cricket stadium. So we had to uh, we used to start football matches there also. So this in is, Eden Gardens, this is Kolkata. Yeah. Yes, Kolkata. Correct. Yeah. So on 16th August 1980, there was a match between East Bengal and Bhuvan who were the two most popular teams in uh, India. So uh, there were a lot of pr- trouble in the uh, stands, and 16 people actually died in stadium on that day. So uh, that was a start where maybe the general population uh, built this perception that football grounds were more violent, that it was not safe to go to football grounds. Then in 1982, uh, India hosted Asian Games. So uh, there was a long football camp. Football was taken pretty uh, seriously for that edition. And India was hoping that uh, they would perhaps win another medal after 1970. So there was a long, uh, it started from actually 1981, this camp and uh, players stayed in one place and they practiced together. There was a a selection trial, Uh, players were brought from all over India. But problem was, uh, these players were amateur on paper, but they got actually paid pretty well at club level. They had their own jobs, but they also get paid from club football. And At that point, they were not that interested to have all these basic facilities at national team because national team didn't give a lot of uh, high-level facilities to Indian players at that point. So one uh, one position that the players had was that they were missing out on the lucrative club football because of this long national camp. So actually, there was during the camp there was a mass walkout of players. And uh, so they walked out of the camp and these were players mostly from East Bengal and Mohan Bagan were the biggest clubs. And uh, so this created a perception in the media that players were actually national traitors. I mean, this is actually a headline from a newspaper 
which called them traitors. Mm. So they eventually came back and obviously most of them were picked also. This uh, situation was, uh, I mean, it was peacefully resolved. But then there was another perception that footballers are uh, giving more importance to club football than national team. Then 1983, obviously, that was the main breaking point where the Indian uh, cricket team, they won the World Cup. It was a fascinating victory. And before that, even the Indian cricket team didn't get a lot of facilities. Even they came from modern, um, from modern backgrounds. I mean, uh, there were no hopers, basically, before 1983. But once they won the World Cup, so at that point, people understood that this was a team sport where we can actually be world-class. I mean, cricket is not played by a lot of nations, but even at that level, India was world-class. And from 1980s onwards, then we got World Club, uh, World Cup telecast. Uh, we had Nehru Cup uh, international tournament, which brought in a lot of international teams. So then people actually understood that the footballers that they idolized at club, club level, they were perhaps not that good at a world level. So again, then gradually the popularity got dropped off. Early 90s, football lost a lot of popularity and cricket then gradually went up in popularity from there. Now that's absolutely fascinating because I, I knew knew none of that at all. That 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 that's that's already made my day. You mentioned their Nehru Cup, yeah, and obviously this leads us back to the birth of India as as an independent nation in forty seven, and Nehru with uh, his his, uh, his his suits with no lapels, uh, Nehru uh, as a huge figure in the new non non aligned world. What role was sport going to play in the projection of the new independent India? Actually, Asian Games was part of that because, I mean, uh, see, uh, by that time, Olympic, it had got a, a level of political influence from the, from the Berlin Games itself. So the basic idea of Asian Games was that it would be non-political. That was how it was started. And uh, India obviously played a big part in that. Uh, actually, G. S. Sondhi, so he was a, a very big figure in the initial organization of Asian Games. So when the 1962 Games were held, uh, they were held in Jakarta. So before the 1962 Asian Games, Israel, they were not given passports to Jakarta. So it was a political reason. So at that, and Taiwan also, I, I guess, yeah, they didn't get passports also. So at that point, Sondhi actually led a very strong protest against the Indonesian government that these countries are not being given passports because it's a political reason. And Asian Games is supposed to be non-political. So due to this, actually throughout the Asian Games of 1962, every Indian athlete or most of the Indian teams, they faced barracking from the crowds. And this happened throughout the Games. Uh, so in a way, India's main position in Asian Games was to make it as apolitical as possible. I see, looking at the, the Indian squad that won, that beat Iran in, in this final in, in, in 51, I see a number of Muslim names in there right, as yeah. well. Now, obviously, yeah. this is this is a few years after the absolute trauma of, of partition. And right. this is now this is now a team representing the nation. Correct. Yeah. How was what was what was the criteria for 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 selection? Or, and was religion or caste, was that part of the criteria for selection? And no, no. Religion or caste was not a part of these selections. They, they, they mostly considered, we have this tournament called Santosh Trophy. So at this point, we had multiple cup tournaments in India, which involved teams from different parts of India. But none of them were like a central uh, AIFF or the central uh, FA managed tournament. What we had was... A Something called Santosh Trophy, which basically pitted states against each other. So you had the state of West Bengal playing against the state of Mysore, Madras playing uh, the state of Hyderabad, things like that. So they scouted players from these tournaments. And this tournament was very important in terms of forming the national team. So that's why you had a large percentage of players coming from either Mysore or West Bengal or Hyderabad. Three teams which did particularly well in this period. And uh, Actually, if you see the squad of uh, 1951, um, there's there's actually a very nice story here. So there's this uh, one of the stars of the team is Amit Khan, uh, who played uh, as a right uh, inside forward. So he was actually part of uh, a very famous East, Beng East Bengal uh, lineup of late 40s and early 50s. Uh, in a way, this is like the La Makina of Indian football. So they were called Five Pandavas. So they have it had a five, uh, it, it, two, three, four formation, five forwards. 
And uh, of these five forwards, uh, you had players from different parts of Southern India. So you had P. Venkatesh, you had Amit Khan, you had Dhanraj, K. Dhanraj, then you had uh, Aparav and Saleh. Now, five Pandavas is essentially a name from Mahabharata, which is uh, the most important book, one of the most important uh, books in Hindu mythology. But these five Pandavas actually had two Muslim players, Amit Khan and Saleh. Both were Muslims. But the, they were named as the five Pandavas. So this gives you an idea about how, how religion was not that important on the football field. And uh, actually, there's one more story. So uh, in the 40s, in uh, around independence, when there were so many uh, communal riots in Kolkata. So uh, Aparao, who was one of the players of the five Pandavas lineup, uh, he and Saleh, who was a Muslim, they were roommates, actually. So uh, during the communal riots, actually, the rioters were searching for a, a, a Saleh. And Aparao actually protected him from uh, rioters, and he himself got injured in that process. So uh, this, I don't think religion or caste played that big a role in at least the selections. Which, could it be said that, nevertheless, um, Muslim or otherwise, religion and caste put to one side for a moment, could it be said that there is a cultural aspect to which parts of India um, have absorbed football and are more likely to be playing right. it or taking it? Because that's, when I look in Nigeria, my own country, you know, for some reason, there is a plethora of players in the national team from the eastern part of Nigeria. And even when I play football here, five aside, in mm -hmm. London, more of the footballers from Nigeria, we play as a Nigerian team, more of them are from the East for whatever yeah. reason. I wonder if there are mm. cultural reasons. Yeah, is it, isn't it Bengal in India, which is the, yes, the, yes, the stronghold? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th that is a traditional stronghold, not anymore. Uh, it used to be the traditional stronghold. So uh, basically... Football is still not popular all over the country. So you have pockets. Uh, traditionally, uh, it was Bengal always because Bengal was the old, Cal Calcutta was the old capital of British India. And uh, Calcutta was where the football actually started, the Indian uh, natives playing football. That's it started in Kolkata and that started from late 1880s. And uh, most of the early clubs or the popular clubs, they were also formed there. And... Uh, at one point, at least in early 80s, we had around nine players coming from the same area in West Bengal, around Kolkata. Uh, and then you had uh, Kerala, which is very uh, popular and famous now. Uh, it gave a lot of players, especially from early 90s. Punjab, uh, Punjab used to have a very uh, distinct football culture and they had got a lot of success in 70s and 80s. Uh, Mysore, uh, which is the current state of Karnataka, uh, places around Bangalore. Uh, you had Mysore was pretty successful in 50s and 60s, same with Hyderabad. But these uh, states, they couldn't sustain their success. Now we have northeastern states. We have Mizoram, Manipur, uh, Assam. A uh, lot of footballers come from these states. Kolkata used to be the main center of football. Still, it is the most popular. I mean, you have the three of the most popular clubs in India based in Kolkata. But culturally, I'll say... Uh, yeah, at least till 80s and 90s, Kolkata uh, used to bring a lot of footballers, but that has somewhat dried up recently. So right now, Northeast is the part which gives most players now. And uh, obviously, Kerala is also up there. During the time of, of the English domination, uh, I've read that Bengal and, and Kolkata was also the centre of resistance. Yes. Uh, and... And one of the reasons I understand that the English moved the capital to New right. Delhi yeah. was to, to to take it away from yeah. the nationalist, the, the stronghold of nationalism in Kolkata. And it seems that in the early years of football, especially the early 20th century, games between Indian teams from Kolkata and British military sides had an enormous political resonance yes, yes what, what was what was football was being good at football seen as an act of political resistance right from the start uh in a way yes because uh see when uh football was started in uh, late 1880s uh, when it became popular among natives so uh the indian football association ifa which is the oldest fa in asia uh, when it was formed, and it was named Indian Football Association, 
but it didn't have any Indian members, native members. So the entire administration was controlled by uh, British administrators. And even when the Calcutta Football League, which is the oldest football league in Asia, which was started in uh, late 1890s, even when it was started, it didn't have any Indian clubs or native clubs participating in the top uh, division. It was only British civilian teams or British army teams. Uh, this gradually changed from 1900 when you have uh, more Indians participating in the administration also and more clubs also getting promoted. Uh, the turning point was 1911 when Mohan Bagan defeated the East Yorkshire Regiment to win the IFA Shield. So before that, Indian clubs had won minor trophies, but three major trophies India had, that one was IFA Shield, one was Durand Cup, the other was the Rovers Cup. Now Durand Cup and Rovers Cup, these were exclusively for British Army teams. Uh, Durand Cup was exclusively for army teams. Rovers Cup was exclusively for British civilian and army teams. No Indian clubs were allowed to participate. So IFA Shield, when it was started, this was started more as a FA Cup uh, structure where teams from different parts of India could actually participate, both native clubs and British clubs. So when Mohan Bagan won the IFA Shield, right, this was this was huge. I mean, no one had expected that a team with Indian players could defeat a full British team. And they had 10 barefoot players, actually, the Mount Bagan team. Only one player uh, wore boots. So this was, in a way, a sign of resistance, where I mean, you, you couldn't match a British citizen on the roads. But on football field, there's no restriction like that. So football was, at that point, viewed as a sign of masculinity, where you can match up to your uh, masters on the field. So... Uh, some of the early icons of the game, Goshtopal and Balaidas Chatterjee, these were both of them were defenders. Balaidas Chatterjee was actually a boxer also. Along, uh, he was a footballer and a boxer both. They were good footballers, but they were actually famous because they could, if they were hit on the ground by a British player, they could hit back. That was their claim to fame. And and this, this was just two examples. I mean, we've had examples of players who were actually involved in the freedom movement. And uh, there was this player from Arian uh, FC who was actually arrested after a game because he was involved in the freedom struggle and he was involved in one of the more violent activities. So we had examples. And also because football matches, they, they brought in on a big crowds. So people used those crowds to protest. There were uh, examples of protests where women came down to protest some arrests. And matches were called off due to that. So due to the crowds and due to the level of popularity that football brought at that time, yeah, it was definitely one vehicle. And also the physicality. It does show you that the trajectory of football over the last century and a half replicates itself right across the globe. You know, the, 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 the story that you're talking about, you could argue, has been part of the struggle of the working classes here in Britain, uh, yeah. as well as, as Tim will know, the sort of liberation struggles in South America where football has played a part. But when we talk about the history, and we'll come back to the earlier history and no doubt talk about the current history, but when we're talking about 1951, what strikes me, you mentioned that the pitch was a lot narrower than uh, would otherwise have been acceptable, but FIFA accepted it. So there was a dialogue with FIFA at the time Apart from that, though, it does seem as if these 1951 Asian Games, the inaugural Asian Games, was something of a haphazard coming together of uh, not official administration, but of yeah. interested parties, including royals, I understand, mm -hmm. and everybody else who wanted to see it. But there was no official Indian government support for it. Yeah, uh... Half as that is true because, I mean, uh, even if you see Asian football in general, I mean, it was not very well organized at that point. I mean, the first Asian Cup, which started five years after the first Asian game, that has had just four teams. I mean, four teams for a continental tournament. And uh, yeah, see, barefoot football, at least till 1953, Indian national teams uh, contain a lot of barefoot players. Only after 1953 did AIFF officially ruled that you have to wear boots even to play domestic football. And uh, FIFA guidelines seemed pretty vague at that point. I think FIFA also changed their guidelines from mid-1950s onward, where you couldn't wear, uh, you had to be booted to uh, compete in a football match. 
and even the uh, duration of matches 60 minutes is not something which is usual but in indian domestic circuit at least the matches were used to be 50 minutes 60 minutes and 70 minutes even till 70s and 80s so uh, i think that played into the whole organization part where uh, the matches were kept at a length which suited the domestic circuit of indian football i guess that that's that's that was one of the reasons and in terms of government support yeah at, at least the football team uh, there, there are stories that at least even in the 1948 Olympics, I mean, uh, there's this whole theory that the government should provide boots for them, which is incorrect because all these players were playing at club level. What did happen was that the government did ask for some cover charge to travel to London because uh, they didn't have enough money to cover for the traveling costs. So, uh, so that's the reason some of the players from Hyderabad City Police. So Hyderabad City Police was one of the leading club sites from Southern India at that time. But the, the players of Hyderabad Police, they, these were policemen. They were actually uh, employed by the police and they didn't have a lot of money. So a couple of players couldn't arrange for that uh, money and so they were not picked for the Olympic squad. But this did happen in the Olympic Games, definitely. And for Asian Games also, because this was the first major tournament that India was organizing. So India didn't have any experience in... Uh, hosting this big uh, an event. And uh, yeah, so there were uh, things which you don't find in the usual FIFA tournaments these days. The game is, is taking place in New Delhi. Yeah. Are people all over the country following what's going on? Yes, definitely in Kolkata and Southern India because they had their own players playing there. So that was one factor. And Kolkata in general, it had a, a high level of interest in football. Because, uh, see, in first Asian games, hockey was not there. So, of the two major team sports, cricket was anyway not there. So, of the two major popular team sports, hockey was not there, so football was there. So, obviously, people had a lot of interest in football. Uh, from the news reports that I saw from 1951, uh, 25,000 people came for the football final. This was the largest attendance. Uh, any of the other athletic events or the swimming events, they couldn't attract that much, that big a crowd. Football final was the most anticipated match uh, of the entire uh, games. And it, it was definitely followed, yes. Which were the it's, players? It's, it's, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Tim. Is, is radio important? And how is yes. the news being spread over the, uh, over the country? Yes, are, radio are people... was very important. Yeah. yeah. Actually, even I have see, uh, heard uh, relays on radio in late 90s and mid 90s even at that point people used to uh, hear, listen to radios for football matches but in 1950s definitely radio was extremely important because people didn't have uh, full access to televisions that was mainly from 70s and 80s so radios and newspapers because newspapers they often uh, got the news two days later especially in the, the the further down you went in the country so radio was very important. Some of the matches were live telecasted. Actually, even before independence, some of the matches, especially from IFA Shield, they were also live telecasted on radio. So yeah, radio was very important. Yeah, I don't know how much you've garnered from the radio that you've heard about the match itself. It always on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, uh, we look at an iconic match. Uh, this is one of the most iconic, certainly for South Asia, when... India beats Iran in the final of the Asian Games in football. Um, there aren't any video uh, clips for us to be able to estimate the match with for a change. There are some pictures. There are some pictures that are still available from this final. I would love to, you know, if you know how, what a difference that narrow pitch made to the outcome of the match, I'd love to... Hear that, but which were the players to look out for? Which of the Indian players, at least, would people have been familiar with? Yeah, so here, uh, so basically, India played a two-three-five formation. This was, I mean, the usual formation in, in that era. And uh, like you mentioned, the narrowness of the pitch it did make a difference in the very first game, where the news report definitely mentions that Indian players also had a bit of difficulty in adjusting to the narrow pitch because teams basically played a winger-based formation even in that era. So Indians did have a problem in the first match and also the turf was completely dry because this was just after uh, winter in Delhi and Delhi is in the most, uh, it doesn't get a lot of uh, moisture. So the field was very dry and that also did cause a bit of problems to Indian players. Uh, in terms of players, uh, so in defense, uh, you had Papan and uh, Shailen Manda. Papan, 
he he i mean both of them were very technically gifted players none of them were like this uh, only physical defender uh tapen he he came from the southern part of india he was so famous tapen is actually his uh, nickname and he was born in a place called thiruvalla in kerala so he's actually named as uh, known as thiruvalla tapen i mean the city name comes before his name that's how he got famous yeah, because he's he's got brazilian shirt name essentially <laughs> <laughs> He's, he's Junior Paulista, you know. He's from São Paulo, so yes, yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah. Right, right. So uh, uh, then, uh, Shalen Mana, he was the captain. He was one of the most uh, decorated defenders of that era. Uh, so in 1953, the English FA they actually published a list of 10 best captains in the world, and Shalen Mana was one of the names on that list. Uh, so uh, he was a thorough gentleman. He he had a reputation out the pitch also, and he he was a great leader. Uh, then uh, one very important name was amit khan uh, from uh, in the forward line so amit khan he he was a trickster he was the kind of player that people came to watch in grounds he was not that interested in scoring goals, goals himself he uh, he was he took more pride in setting up goals he was like a schemer uh, if i if i can use that term and uh, in late 1940s and early 50s uh, some swedish clubs toured india uh, helsingborg fc so uh, the manager of the swedish club uh, uh, i think his name was ulf lyver he actually was so impressed with amit khan that he told amit khan that he should be playing in europe he was that good uh, he was a barefoot player i mean he he took pride in playing barefoot and he, he was an excellent dribbler he could set up goals and then uh, you had sent a forward so, yeah. before we move on from amit khan i'm just looking here at um, his bio i noticed that he only died 6 years ago and yeah. that was at the age of 90 that incredible age in any case i wonder if th- there are people took time out to speak to him subsequently so are there modern um, videos of him talking about his footballing career and so on do we learn anything from yes him? yes you he's actually very celebrated especially in the club where he played east bengal east bengal he, he's rated as one of the best ever so you'll find videos where uh, late interviews of him also even till 1990s and even early 2000 you you should be able to find videos of him speaking yes brilliant sorry you were going Col- to move on yeah. sorry colombia which is a very very regional country uh and it, it really kind of exists as a unified entity much more now these days because of air links before that it's it's difficult to traverse so they're very distinct regions and it's often been thought in colombia that the different regions produce different kinds oh. of players Now, the city of medellin is hard working and industrial so it produces hard working players the areas on the coast life is a little bit more free and easy so it produces the individual talents is there a similar d- dynamic in india where different yeah, regions are seen as producing different types of players absolutely so you have uh, west bengal which used traditionally which produced more technically gifted players people with more skills because i mean the turf they played on that was a soft turf so you had a long monsoons in bengal so you had muddy grounds so uh, to success, to get success on turfs like that you need to have some bit of skill rather than physicality i mean there were physical players but bengal players were traditionally viewed as more technically gifted and more tactically sound then you have punjab punjab uh, people in punjab they are more sturdily built so the punjab full uh, brand of football it was viewed as more like the traditional long long ball game where uh, people used to launch in crosses and they were not technically that gifted but they were very physical they were very tough and they had no uh, fear of opponents so that was punjab kerala again uh, you have all the southern states kerala mysore they again they had all these skilled players they had delicate ball skills because again they came from uh, places or turfs which encouraged that type of play and then now you have northeastern players who often come from the hilly areas and who have a lot of stamina who have a lot of who can run for the entire 90 minutes so that is another type or another tradition of football you have this is incredible because what what you're saying you're giving the lie to the theory from a lot of coaches that you hear time and time again saying that oh well indian players don't have the physique for example to compete with european footballers either they... that, 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 that one died for me watching cricket in the 70s because we used to think that about indian cricket in the 70s and then they introduced that this fa- fabulous 
fast bowling all rounder called Kapil Dev. Yeah. And you look at him and you think, wow, no, I don't want to face him. He's scary. Uh, so that idea for me died in the, in the seventies, but it's amazing that that idea is still around, isn't it? But it's also what Somnath is saying about the stamina. You know, you come from a certain region; it makes absolute sense because we know, for example, uh, the uh, the advantage that you know teams from very mountainous regions in South America have over other teams have a certain kind of stamina, and they play a certain kind of way, or want to play in a certain kind of. Uh, landscape to excel over their opponents. Here, you've got people born in the mountains. Well, it stands to reason they've got a certain amount of stamina. They're going uphill off the way, you know. Yeah, they're walking long up Long distance wall. runners all train at altitude these of days. Of course they do, yeah. But at very reason. But, you know, I just, well, let's come on to the sort of modern context because there's a lot of questions around that. I think we should sort of talk about this match, though. Um, so it's the 10th of March, 19... 51, India versus Iran, final of the Asian Games. It's on in New Delhi. 25,000 people are there, as you've said. Uh, what do you know about the match, how the match unfolded? Yeah, so for that, uh, Iran had defeated Japan in the semi-final. So uh, actually the first leg, uh, this was the era of replayed matches. So in the first match, it ended 0-0 even after extra time in the the second replayed match, Iran won 3-2 against Japan. India had a far easier match against Afghanistan. India defeated Afghanistan 3-0. This was a pretty rough match and a couple of Afghan players was ejected. Uh, but uh, India comparatively had an uh, easier route to the final. So in the final, uh, first difference was that every Iranian player, they were boots. And India, India had a lot of players who, who didn't wear any boots. So initially, be it due to the crowd or be it due to the booted players, uh, most of the news reports, they mentioned that the Indian forward line seemed scared, at least in the first half. I mean, they didn't make that many forays into the forward line. Uh, well, there was, there was five of them on that forward line in that right, narrow right. pitch. I'd be scared <laughs> as well, you know. <laughs> So uh, 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 Shiv Mewalain, uh, Mewalal, who was the centre forward and who was the most prolific goal scorer of that era, he tried to lead the forward line, but uh, players around him, uh, even Amit Khan included, they, they were not that uh, good in the first half at least. Iran, uh, they did mount a lot of uh, attacking moves. So Baland Anthony in goal uh, and Chalan Manna and also Chandan Singh in uh, central midfield along with Noor Mohammad. They did a lot of cleanup activity uh, in the first half. So that was the reason India could keep a clean sheet in first half. Now, the story goes that at halftime, uh, both the Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and also President Rajendra Prashad, Dr. Rajendra Prashad, both were present uh, in the stands. So the story goes that during halftime, uh, both came down at the uh, dressing room. And uh, especially Nehru, he spoke to Mewalal. He said, Mewa, get me a goal in second half. I've come to the stadium to see you score. So then in second half, uh, I think around five or 10 minutes had uh, passed. Then uh, Runu Gohatagutta, who was one of the uh, inside forwards, he uh, swung in a cross. And then Mewalal, he struck from just outside the box. It was a drop volley. And that was the only goal in the match. So after the goal, again, uh, India defended pretty strongly. Again, Manna was in, in very good form in that match. But that goal made the entire difference in that match. And one interesting story about Mewala is that he actually didn't want to play in that final because there was a family tragedy and he wanted to leave uh, for uh, his family. But then he was convinced by the Indian coach to stay. And uh, the prime minister assured him that he'll provide an Air Force plane so that he can travel after the match. So once the medal ceremony was done, he was whisked away from the ceremony. He boarded an Indian Air Force plane and then he traveled to his home. It's incredible, isn't it? That, great like stories, I say, great stories. Well, but the story is replicated elsewhere. You go to Nigeria, I promise you, if Nigeria in the final of football, the president is going to go to the dressing room like he's got a right to be there <laughs> and say, Oh, we are asking. <laughs> give us a go. I'm fascinated that J J Japan are there. Now, is the, I wonder if this is Japan being welcomed back into the fold of nations. Yeah. Uh, after the Second World War. Yeah. So it's important in that context, which leads me to another question, where in, in, in cricket, India could always play the best. 
They could all, and, and also there, there's, you know, the, the, the colonial situation with England, mm-hmm. but they can play against right. Australia and India, Pakistan games. You know, <laughs> there, there's really, really something right. there. In football, in Asia, Asia is such a random amalgamation over such a huge amount of space. Right. Do you think that one of the things that maybe held the national team back is the fact that you're restricted to Asia? And there's there's not the edge, apart from playing Pakistan, maybe, there's not the edge and there's not the quality to help to help uh, improve the team. Uh, at least in 1950s and 60s, India did get some sort of international exposure, mainly due to Olympics. So you had um, 1948 where India played France. Then in 1952, India actually played a full strength Yugoslavia because all these Eastern European teams, they had their full strength teams in Olympics. India lost 10-1, but it was a full strength uh, Yugoslavian team. In 1956, India was actually scheduled to play Hungary in the first match, but then Hungary pulled out at the last moment. So India defeated Australia 4-2, which is a very famous win in Indian football history. Then again, in the semi-finals, India played Yugoslavia, which again was a full-strength Yugoslavian team. Now, uh, again, in the next Olympics, India had the French Olympic team, which was mostly amateur players. But a more important match was against Hungary. So Hungary had Florian Albert, who went on to win the Ballo d'Or a few day, years later. And uh, this was, again, a full-strength Hungarian team. So India had at least that exposure uh, through Olympics. And also, uh, be it due to political reason or be it just uh, um, uh, an interest about the country, there were visits from a lot of foreign clubs in 50s and 60s. And I guess the most star-studded team was the USSR team of 1955. So uh, from 1955, there was a political uh, relationship strengthening between India and USSR also. And the visit of the football team was a part of that larger political uh, picture. So the USSR team, it, it was it was full strength. It had uh, Lev Yashin, it had Igor Neto, uh, it had the Russian Pele, Strath, uh, Igor Strathlov. So it was a full strength team and they played all over India. They toured for, a, I guess, a couple of months. They played around 13 to 14 matches. They scored 100 goals. And uh, they never lost a match. But it, it was a full-strength team. India also went to USSR the uh, following year to play a few matches. So India had that level of exposure, at least in 50s and 60s. Now, from 70s onwards, again, it was India themselves also didn't participate in a lot of tournaments. And obviously, the World Cup, the entire World Cup situation, where India didn't play any qualifiers till 1980s. So if you are dropping off out of qualifiers, then you're anyway missing a lot of uh, international football exposure. I mean, obviously, India couldn't qualify for World Cup given the structure of the qualifiers at that time, where Asia and Africa, they were clubbed together for one spot. But at least that exposure would have been there. And obviously, India also dropped out of 1950 World Cup, where India was supposed to play Sweden, Italy, and I guess uh, Peru uh, in the in the. Do you know why stage. that was? Because I've read that it was about the barefoot issue and I've no. read that it wasn't about the barefoot issue. So please sort this one out for me. Why was it? Why did India not play yeah, in it, was, it was never about the barefoot players because Indian players, not just in 1950s, from late 18th, 1880s itself, many Indian players were playing in boots. It was not like everyone was playing barefoot. It was more of a matter of choice because the, the concept was that you could control the ball better if you play barefoot. I mean, that was uh, their choice. A lot of players played in boots when it rained because it was easy, easier to get a grip. But when it didn't rain, when the ground was dry, they pre- uh, preferred to play bare feet. So most of the players who were supposed to go for the 1950 Olympics, they could play in boots also. And many of them did play in boots at club level at least. Especially players from Hyderabad and uh, Hyderabad City Police. They were definitely playing in boots. Now... I mean, there has been many theories. Uh, some people say that it was because of uh, the government could not af- uh, afford to send the team to Brazil. But the Brazilian government has actually agreed to pay for the passage for Indian team at one point. The main, the, it seems very basic now, but one of the reasons was that the Indian FA was not sure if the World Cup was an amateur, amateur tournament or not. Because at that point, Olympics was more important. India had participated in the 40 games, 48 games. India was supposed to play in Asian Games after the World Cup. And there was also the 1952 Olympics. What the FA was not sure, and this was not the age of internet, right? you didn't get clear idea about the rules at that point. So they were not sure that if they participated in the World Cup, will that affect the amateur status of players? 
and how will that impact the teams that want to send to Olympics and Asian Games? So it seems very strange now because, but given the status of World Cup at that point in 1950, maybe no, that, that it's, all make, that it's all makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's brilliant. Thank you very much. So what about now, though? Because if we move forward to the present day, you still got the challenge of where Indian football uh, finds its place in the international landscape. So you've got a huge country, a billion and a half people there, but we haven't got a football uh, tradition or football current present day football culture that competes on the big stage, on the on the global stage. Um, we've seen how, and you touched on it, how cricket has become an even bigger sport in India than it is in the home of cricket, the apparent home of cricket here. Uh, India is the largest cricket audience in the world. And you'd have thought that some of those Bollywood stars who spend millions signing up English cricketers or cricketers from around the world would think, oh, let's try football. Uh, but it's not quite there in terms of glamour stakes for them. I get that. What about with this Saudi Arabian intervention into the global football landscape? We've seen them just this week offering 250 million quid to buy Kylian Mbappe, for example, and possibly pay him about 700 million quid a year on, on top of that. How is that, if anything, affecting Indian football and Indian players? I know India imports a lot of players from, say, Africa and so on, who play in your leagues. How, how is it? Is there a knock-on effect from the Saudi Arabian experience and will there be a consequence of that further down the road? Yeah, India, India actually imports a lot of players from Nigeria especially. I mean, uh, many of our superstars are actually Nigerians, especially from 80s and 90s. So, uh, in terms of yeah popularity, some of these film stars are actually investing in some of these ISL clubs. But the main problem of Indian football was uh, the entire structure was amateur for a very long time. I mean, the practice pitches were not proper. Uh, players, they had a separate day job and they all, they were also playing football, but that was mainly like a hobby. So you are not a full-time footballer. There were some full-time footballers, but mostly it was an amateur structure. And now Asia is a very dynamic uh, region. So when Japan started uh, with the J-League in late uh, 80s and early 90s, before that, Japan also had an amateur structure. I mean, they were at par at in, with India, perhaps. But when they started the J-League, the, prof the, the professionalization of J-League, that was very fast. And the way they improved, that, that, that is not something that India can quickly replicate, given the entire complex structure uh, of states and uh, regions that India has. There has been some efforts in past few years where, uh, so we had this old... Uh, national level league called I-League, which had a lot of uh, traditional or uh, legacy clubs. But many of these clubs were actually somewhat amateur. They, they were extensions of office teams and they were sometimes police teams were even played in I-League. So uh, ISL was started specifically to give a more franchise structure to Indian football. Uh, initially, it was more of uh, glitz and glamour. They brought in aging Del Piero and players like that who didn't have a lot of impact, but at least they grabbed the eyeballs initially. Uh, at least in last few years, ISL seems to be maturing in their structure where they are recruiting players more on merit and less on just us being a star name. Uh, ISL definitely has improved the popularity of football. Infrastructurally, also, I said, has somewhat improved Indian football. I mean, uh, the money is more. In, uh, the, the domestic players are getting paid better now. But uh, we also have to understand that clubs are not making any money out of these tournaments. This is essentially a social responsibility activity for many of these franchises. I mean, they're pumping a lot of money, but uh, how sustainable this model is, that but will With probably... a population that big, how can they not be making money? Uh, from what I hear, the lot of TV money is not being shared yet because this essentially still has a very private structure, this entire uh, franchise league. It's not a fully uh, federated structure yet. Maybe it'll change in future. If they didn't even have relegation. If they don't have relegation now. They didn't have promotion till last year. That's starting only now. So this was like a organized like a separate league from the usual league structure that we had. And then it eventually superseded the league eventually. So... Uh, 
there has been some improvements, but uh, the problem is that Asia is a very dynamic region. I mean, you have so many countries in Asia, so few spots, especially in World Cup. And uh, see, Australia, South Korea, Japan, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, these five will already always be there in terms of World Cup qualification. The rest of the spots are basically up for grabs, and there were so many competitors for that. You have Uzbekistan, you have Syria, you have Lebanon, and all these countries. India is making some improvements. So right now, our rank is in uh, late 90s. So we've at least crossed the 100 mark. Uh, we are playing more international matches now than we used to do in past. Uh, we are also winning. Uh, I mean, we are right now in a pretty good winning and unbeaten streak right now. And the federation, at least, they seem to be pretty clear where they want to go. See, before what used to happen was that India used to win a couple of matches and the next day, the federation would come with a target that we'd, come, uh, uh, we'd qualify for the next World Cup. But now they seem to have a more uh, a more practical target that will qualify regularly for Asian Cup. Then we'll try to progress from the group stages of Asian Cup. So we are, basically we have to move step by step. I mean, it's not a quick fix. How long will that be before then we see an Indian national team competing, maybe first of all in the Olympic Games and in the World Cup or whichever route it takes, but also crucially, how long will it be before we start seeing? Uh, uh, this is a question really for a uh, football pundit, but as a historian, you're clearly an expert in football as well. So forgive me for asking you to look forward rather than backwards. Historians always love to go backwards, don't they? But um, one step backwards, two steps forwards on this program. But how long will it be before we start seeing Indian stars of football emerging? I dare say, not just on the subcontinent, but in places like Britain, where there are oh, the diaspora, large... Yeah. yeah, yeah, right across the diaspora, not least here in the UK. Uh, we had Indian origin players at least playing, like Michael Chopra was a pretty famous example. Uh, there were also talks that he may play for India at one point. But I guess the problem is that we don't have any dual citizenship in India. So you have to give up your British citizenship to play for Indian national team. And obviously, then their club careers will be affected. So that is... A major reason why many of these Indian origin players, they, they don't eventually, uh, even they express their uh, interest in playing for India, but finally, I, get, I guess they get stuck there. Uh, playing in World Cup, that, that, that is difficult. I mean, uh, at least given the, there are improvements, but uh, given the pace in which Asian football is improving, uh, we are still not at, at that level yet. Uh, maybe in, in 48 team World Cup, we, we may get lucky in the qualifiers. That That is one way. Another option is to host it because we've hosted a few under 17 World Cups, both men and women World Cup, and both were done pretty well. So maybe eventually, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, India can host a World Cup and qualify as a host. But qualifying on merit, at least right now, it's pretty difficult given the entire structure. Maybe, maybe then the, the club game will give you a route because the architecture is is likely to change, not only with what's happening in Saudi Arabia, but also with the United States and so on. And the plan to have a club World Cup with 32 teams, there'll be spots for right. Asia. Yeah. So an Indian, an Indian club with talent from all over the world, with enough money behind it, could qualify for that and could end up playing against the best through that route. Do you see that that's something as, 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 as something which is feasible? Uh, again, for that, I mean, see, there are so many rich clubs in Asia right now. Even if I leave aside the Saudi Arabian uh, League, you have Japan who have, who have a very developed uh, domestic structure already. Korean clubs, are, they usually do very well. Iranian clubs, they have their own legacy in Asian club football. So again, China. these... China. China also, yeah. So all of these countries, they have their own uh, legacies and they're they they are already pretty developed in club football. So there mm -hmm. also, it's pretty difficult. Even if we, so you have to attract all these talents. They have to play in India also to participate in the, the, these club football. At least the ISL till now, it's not at that level where it will be able to attract all these players. They are attracting some players from A-League at least right now because uh, A-League seems to be in a slightly dicey financial situation and the ISL seems to be in a, stronger financial uh, situation. So, few of the A-League players are coming in India. But uh, overall, I think, uh, at least for Club World Cup, even that may take a bit of time. I don't at know if... We'll always have 1951. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I don't know if you were fully briefed, Somnath, but the second part of the um, Brazilian Shirt Name podcast is a look at the sort of musical landscapes Correct. of the time. Yes. Obviously, obviously, we're not looking at the Indian musical landscape and even the British one because uh, there were no charts in 1950. But, it, but it, it does lead to a question because, I mean, my or our perspective of Indian music really came through the Beatles. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, but nowadays it's through Bollywood movies, though, isn't it? Yeah, but they don't really come and to Brazil. So <laughs> we, we don't, I don't really get a chance to see them. But, and how did how did Indians? I know there there, there wouldn't be just one Indian view, you know, a multiplicity of uh, multiplicity of views. How did Indians see like the Beatles and that whole sixties English culture? The adopt, Ravi Shankar moment. Yeah, yeah. adopt Ravi Shankar and, and adopt Indian music. Was that was that liked or was that seen as an intrusion? Uh, it was liked actually because uh, in sixties uh, there was also a lot of hippie culture in India. When many hippies came to India, so the Beatles were. I mean, I'm not a historian in that part, but maybe the Beatles were seen as an extension of the hippie culture. And Ravi Shankar obviously had a very famous moment in Woodstock when he played there. Well, you know, I mentioned Bollywood movies and the two great stars of Bollywood. Uh, soundtracks are Lata Mangeshka, the late great who died last year, and her sister Asha Bosley Asha Bosch, yeah. as well. And they would have they're old enough to have been around at this time. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to include into this conversation anything they may have done around 1951. Um but we've been looking at the US charts, the billboard charts around in those days. I think it's safe to say this is uh crooner capital of charts and um at the top of the tree is the greatest crooner of them all uh without exception Nat King Cole out of thought mm. and following fast behind him in the charts so he's at number one and we'll come on to the choose in a second but following fast behind him in the charts is a crooner who we lost just a few Indeed. days ago as Tony we speak yeah yeah, yeah. saw so him at the Albert Hall in the early 90s well was, uh, a fabulous you know, memory he has done so much for music in general, still very much up with the modern contingents of uh, singers, uh, famously with Lady Gaga, he did some duets and everything. Nat King Cole, first of all, too young. It's been done by several other people. Mm -hmm. Donny Osmond, dare I say, in the 1970s. Before that, Jimmy Young, who was that famous radio personality, subsequently over here, but it was like a teenage heartthrob. But I think it's fair to say that Nat King Cole's version at number one is at number one and deserves to be at number oh, one. Oh, quite right. But <laughs> on, the, 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 the fabulous thing about but he wasn't a singer. No, he was a pianist. Yeah, was of a course, pianist. he was jazz a pianist, pianist who who become becomes a singer. It's unbelievable. Well, when when we look, you look back at a chart from nineteen fifty one. The thing, oh yeah, it's all old and fuddy duddy, mm -hmm. and it you is. miss out. You miss out on the on the dynamism of the thing because there's big changes happening. Yeah, now the yeah. the era just before has been the era of swing. Swing is absolutely dominant. Big band swing. And what Nat Cole represents is a move away from that to small groups instead of the big, because the big bands are quite expensive to run. You know, you, there's a lot of mouths to feed in, in, in a big, big band. It's much more economical in a nightclub setting to have a, have a quartet, something like that. So you know, Nat Cole is part of that. It's a quartet, play the piano. Can you sing as well? Go on, give us a song. Well, this is fascinating to hear what the historian thinks because was was India at this time because this kind of music as um, as Tim is saying it was a, a game changer over here in Europe let alone in America was but it that crooning, in India as crooning well? is is revolutionary of and course was, it is it was seen as, as as too sensual well do you know you what I've used I've, the microphone in this way in this intimate way. What I thought about and I apologize apologize some now because I'm coming to you but uh, myself and. And Tim always go at loggerheads yeah. when it comes to the music. <laughs> He's he always wrong, consistently wrong. He never learns. Yeah. He represents the side of humanity <laughs> that won't change, you know, that will can a leopard change its spots? Not on that side of humanity. <laughs> However, um, the interesting thing about what you said here, Tim, is that actually crooning is an art form that comes from operatic singing. That's why half of these people in this charts that are crooners, they're opera singers. Mario Lanza. Yeah, but you Mario, need the microphone. 
Oh, of course you do. And it's all about making love to the microphone. You know, it's 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 not hitting the back of the stalls. You know, it's just hitting the microphone. Oh, it's totally. It's, I'm not saying it's the same thing, but I will say that the reason why crooning took over is because the uh, the eloquence of this generation of singers. Um, and the, you, you've got the sort of crybaby singers that are going to become popular, like Guy Mitchell as well, um, singing the blues. Uh, My truly, truly fair number twenty there. But most of this chart is dominated by people who've got big voices and come from a big voice uh, tradition. And, and they've adapted. They've adapted to the intimacy to, of oh, radio. Hundred percent. But they adapted still wearing the suits of you know that were expected of them at the time, even though they were teenage heartthrobs. They were dressed in suits like their parents and no doubt their grandparents as well. But were people in India in 1951 listening to this? Um, I wouldn't say crap because no, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's it's not, not. Is it? yeah. But a modern, a modern listener might look at that and think, What is this? What is this you're trying to feed me? Well, were people in India listening to this in 1951, four years after independence, and just uh, you know, no, I, I, I don't think that's likely, but uh, because India itself had a very diverse musical culture you had all these bollywood even at that point we had film music and you had a very long, long tradition of classical music where you have two distinct uh, traditions one is the northern indian or the hindustan classical and you have the southern india or the carnatic classicals so even at that point the bollywood singers they used to be come trained af uh, after they took training in either of these uh, traditions they used to come singing in bollywood so uh, Indian uh, popular music at that point was mostly Bollywood. I mean, uh, the, the English, uh, the band music or the type of music, they gradually came from 60s onwards. So we had some uh, twist hits, actually. You had this Chevy Chase uh, twist song. So that was actually adopted in a Hindi song by this music composer called R.D. Burman. Uh, the song is called Our Twist Kare. So it's basically a twist music. The, just the song is in Hindi. So... From 60s onward, it flowed more. But in 50s, I think it was mostly either classical music or the local traditions or the Hindi film music. One of the things that fascinates me is the speed of 20th century progress. Like, I mean, say that the 32 Olympics in, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, it's the first one with a new kind of aristocracy. The film stars from the talkies. This has never yeah. been done before. There's never been this, this this kind of thing before. And the 32 Olympics kind of showcases them. And then you get, you know, Johnny Weissmuller going from Olympic swimmer to, to, to Tarzan and, Tarzan, and, and yeah. so on. So, you know, and, and the first sound picture is 1927. And it takes until, you know, the end of the 20s, the early 30s to get sound up and running properly. So when did cinema become really important in India? with Indians making films in local languages about your stories. And was there a, a political edge to this or was it romantic escapism right from the start? There, there, there was a political edge to this because I think uh, there were some uh, instances of the Cold War politics being played here. So you had some Bollywood, Hollywood uh, studios backing some of the studios and then you have the Soviet we had a more distinct political connection with India in 1950s. So uh, actually there was this web series called Jubilee, which was recently made. And they actually covered one of these uh, things where you have this Soviet propaganda uh, films or filmmakers driving one section of the filmmakers. And then you had the Hollywood uh, backing. So uh, Raj Kapoor, who was one of India's most popular film stars of this era, he was actually very popular in USR, USSR. A lot of his films were showcased there and uh, this was again, I guess there was a political connection because India was India was non-aligned, but India was also more closer to the, uh, the Russia Soviet Union. The USSR, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that very clearly. Do you know one thing that is missed out often a lot when people in the West talk about whatever the West is, by the way, talk about West of India, everywhere West of India. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Uh, talk about Indian film. One thing that is often lost out is the impact it made right across not just the non-aligned states, but I would say right across what they call the global south nowadays. Because if you went to Nigeria in the 1960s and particularly in the 1970s, where we had these huge open air cinemas, it was Indian films wow. back to back to back to I back no right across Africa. So it had this huge market in the days when you had to pay 
for that <laughs> for that uh, you know film for the celluloids. It wasn't like you could you could uh, pirate it or anything like that. So I'm sure you found a way to sneak in. No, I didn't actually. But thank you for <laughs> suggesting that. One thing I'll say quickly about this chart: it's three years, if you like, before Elvis Presley is introduced into the scene uh, from Memphis, Tennessee, but. You can hear what's going to happen here already. In fact, at number 10, Patsy Page's version of the Tennessee Waltz, which is one of these standards of kind of uh, country, I would suggest, almost at a pinch, but certainly um, a tune of its time. It's the best one. Loads of, it generally is one of my favourite songs. Sam Cooke did a version of it. Sam Cooke's version is decent because Sam Cooke's got a great voice. But it's not as, um, it's not, it doesn't have the aura, if you like, of this one. Tennessee Waltz, you can almost hear her. It's a plaintive song about somebody who goes to a dance and she meets an old friend of hers and she, you know, goes and says, oh, by the way, this is my partner. And then the old friend waltzes off with her partner. And, but, Patty Page puts it across so well, it's amazing. And there's another song in the charts as well, which harks to the very, very, very early stages of what's to become rock and roll, at least part of it, which is Cold, Cold Heart. Uh, Tony Bennett is several tunes of his are in the charts, number two with Because of You, but at uh, number eight, he's got Cold, Cold Heart, which is an old Hank Williams song. When you hear early Hank Williams, the Hank Williams, the real Hank Williams, not Hank Williams Jr., when you hear his music, you realise where rock and roll is going to go very soon um, because it's partly blues, but there is a nod to the country music of the time as well. Apart from that, I think you can take or leave this chart myself. I think I've got nothing against crooner music, but when I look back at it, there's some terrible songs in it um <laughs> how high the moon les paul one of the great guitar geniuses and also creator of the les paul guitar is in there with a the tune that yeah on reflection he probably had not uh he was better off not doing but hey who am i to say um i hope you've enjoyed this one somnath <laughs> this has been yeah, a real treat yeah. for us yeah, absolutely how can people contact you do you have any books out there or anything that we can mention uh, no, I'm not. Uh, I, I have this Twitter profile, which is Indian Football H, uh, which I've been running for the past five years. I used to write them on websites before, so I don't have a book. Uh, I have articles on my websites like uh, In Bed with Maradona, These Football Times. and uh, oh, I'm going to read that one. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Somna Sengupta, uh, you've been listening to the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. We'll have another one for you next week. <laughs>